All right, Rob. So your new book, Sacred Cow with Diana Rogers. First of all, I just want to say thank you. (laughs) Thank you. We can always depend on you and the industry to show up, you know, like Game Changers came out and we've got all this like vegan messaging and I'm getting constant questions as a health coach, like, oh, I think we're going to go plant-based. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to go do all this like uneducating and share all these new things. And I'm like, nope, here comes Rob straight up, straight out of the gate. He's like, nope, we're going to combat this right away. So can you, (laughs) first, thank you. And second we, of all, we drew, like, our, we drew the short straw. Like we didn't want to do it, but there was like this cabal <laughs> of people, and they're like, "Yeah, Diana and Rob, you guys get stuck with this." So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is so you. This is such a Rob Wolf move. You're like, "Nope, let's let's act. Let's get it done." You know. And I think I w- I have to say too, Rob. But like before we get started in this, just seeing you at conferences, I just have so much respect for you in the industry because not only do you show up like this and make changes, you make big moves and bold moves, but also just in the nuances of seeing you talk to people in the halls, you know, it's like, you're not trying to network or you're trying to help people. You are Thank just you. in there to help people. And it is so beautiful. So like, I just want you to know that I have so much respect for you and I see what you're doing. So thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> First. All right. Now let's, let's get into meat. Let's get into Sacred Cow. What's what's the premise of this book? So, you know, it's interesting. It was almost 10 years ago, NPR reached out to me and they wanted to do a debate about the health considerations of eating meat. And it was going to be myself and a couple other folks. And then uh, John Mackey, who's the CEO of Whole Foods and John McDougal and one other person. So kind of like the vegans versus the the kind of omnivores. And I said that we couldn't, have a conversation around only the health implications because inevitably folks will shift gears and start talking about environment and ethics. Mm -hmm. And so we need to to be able to address all of that. And we were motoring forward and it looked like it was going to go, but then they pulled out at the last minute. And I I suspect the reason why is, although John Mackey recommends a vegan diet. Clearly he makes a significant amount of money selling animal products. And so the, the whole ethical thing kind of, mm-hmm. kind of collapses on that. But it, it stuck with me that it's almost like a game of whack-a-mole when you start trying to address health then people shift the discussion yeah. to ethics. And once you address ethics and they'll shift it to the environment. Right. And so you really have to address all of them. And the interesting thing in developing wired to eat or not wired to eat, but a a sacred cow is that it, all these things really do fit together. Like when you start unpacking the ethical considerations, there are some interesting implications when you consider it, it, assuming we're right, like assuming what we're putting forward is, is right. That actually properly raised grazing animals may be our best tool against climate change that properly raised grazing animals may be disproportionately nutritious for humans to to include in their diet. And if those ideas are true or they hold any water at all, then it really changes the ethics conversation a whole lot. And then we, we get into the ethical consideration. You know, how many animals, how many ecosystems are destroyed via the industrial row crop food system versus what occurs in a, a well-managed, holistically managed type of, of regenerative agriculture system. And those comparisons have been done. And it, it, it's interesting. Um, things are said often enough that they, they become seemingly truth, but they're still not truth. Like there are some, mm. some memes that float around out there that uh, animal husbandry, uh, cattle in particular, is the largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions mm-hmm. in the United States. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it's less than 2.8% of the total when you, when you look at it. And, and then from there, biogenic sources of greenhouse gases, they're part of a cycle. Where, you know, and so if we start demonizing methane that comes from cows, then actually shellfish release enormous amounts of methane, termites release enormous amounts of methane. (laughs) And there have actually been suggestions to remove termites and shellfish from the world to save us from climate change, which is insanity. Oh my gosh. The, The suggestion is to reduce the amount of life to protect life. And so this is kind of how divorced all of us are mm-hmm. from ecology and the way that nature works and whatnot. And so it, it, when we turned in the book originally, it was 600 pages. It's about 300 pages and it's, it's pared down form. But 
Wow. You know, we're trying to tackle the health considerations, ethical and environmental considerations all at the same time. And uh, I think we did a pretty good job. Like it, it was a, a lot of material to cover and then also make it readable and have a story arc to it and whatnot. But yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I have not read it yet. I literally cannot wait to get my hands on it. I had um, a regenerative agriculture rancher on the podcast a few episodes ago, um, Eric from Rep Provisions, and he oh, educated, yeah. yeah, you know, Rep Provisions. So yep. he, he educated us on this. And like, I cry when I hear about this because there's so much misinformation. He, here he is, here are these regenerative agriculture ranchers are so connected to nature on another level that most of us don't understand. And nobody knows nobody hears their message, right? Like we, we just hear exactly what you talk about. Like it's killing the environment. It's horrible for the animals. We all saw food ink. We all got traumatized. You mm -hmm. know, I didn't want to eat meat after I saw that either. Right. I was just like, Oh my gosh, this is horrible. So we just pendulum swung to like no right. meat. Right. So can, what, what have you guys found as far as like, I mean, where, where should we start? Should we start with the, where do you start in the book? Do we start with the ethical? We argument? started the, the nutritional piece, interestingly, okay. uh, and we waffled on that. We were going to start with the ethical position first, but we actually ended up making the health case, the environmental case, and then finished on ethics. Cool. And when we really started digging in and looking at the health considerations of a meat inclusive versus a meat ex excluding diet, yeah. it, it doesn't paint veganism in a, a particularly good light. Like what, one of the only randomized control trials that we have looked at developing children in, in, um, in Africa, and they were, uh, these kids are already usually right at the margin, but they, they um, equalized the amount of calories they were receiving initially. And one group had a meat supplement, one group had a dairy supplement, and one group just had additional calories. And the meat supplemented group ended up performing better cognitively, behaviorally, and physically. They had lower rates of, of you know, colds and all that type of stuff. And it's only one study. It's small, but it was really the, 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 the results were pretty powerful. And then when we look at vegan and vegetarian populations and the failure to thrive, particular in, in children, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. And there are, are millions of women around the world, like right now, social justice topics are a really hot issue and rightfully so. But what's ironic there is you have a largely white, wealthy, vegan centric group of people, mainly in the United States and Europe, that are suggesting that the rest of the world should abandon their traditional food systems which would mean that they would be wholly dependent on our, our row crop exports because huge tracts of the world, they can't do anything but raise grazing animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, there's, it, unbeknownst to many people, there are tens of millions of women around the world that are legally not able to own title on land, but they can own grazing animals. Mm -hmm. And this is literally their sole source of income and social status and now the Western world is telling them that they're bad because they're raising animals, that this is going to destroy the environment. And I know I'm getting, this is where it all starts kind of no, dovetailing together, but we, we really, um, we looked at some of the reality that removing animal products, particularly for low income individuals and people in the developing world, it will virtually doom them to a poor productivity, poor, you know, cognitive status, like the, this stuff is pretty well established. So we, we really looked at that health piece. We looked at the other side and, you know, some of the health claims like from, from game changers and whatnot, you know, that uh, eating meat is as bad as a pack a day smoking habit. And some of the, the studies that, that are looked at there, nutrition is a really difficult thing to pin down. Like you can't put hundred thousand people on one diet and another hundred thousand yeah. people on another diet and control it perfectly and let them live their whole lives and, and look at the numbers. So they do these things called retrospective studies where they will have people fill out food frequency questionnaires. Basically they will ask them, what did you eat yesterday, last week, last month? Some of these things ask people to recall what they ate up to 12 years ago. <laughs> and it, it, it's, these studies have been studied by other people and the, 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 the results are, are just garbage. Like people right. lie, they don't remember. Right. Um, people always say, oh yeah, I eat tons of salad and, and yeah. I, I, you know, <laughs> nothing else. Right. And so, but even in these, these very arguably poorly um, performed studies, 
Let, let's take colon cancer as an example. It's one of them that we highlighted in the book. As a background potential, everybody in the United States has a potential of about 5% for developing colon cancer at some point in their life. These studies that demonize uh, uh, meat consumption, assuming that the data is even correct, which is, is I, I think, a stretch, but assuming the data is correct, if you eat meat every day your whole life, your, your risk of colon cancer goes from 5% to 6% in absolute terms. So 5 in, in 100 to 6 in 100. But this gets <laughs> super, you know, it, it's kind wow. of like, yeah, it, it, it's really crazy. But the way that this gets scary is that it is statistically manipulated. So that's absolute risk. The relative risk between five and six is 18%. Why not round it up to 20%? So eating meat is a 20% increase in can oh. uh, colon cancer risk. Oh, wow. And this is where some of these, these funny uh, numbers come from. Wow. So. We went through cancer, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and really kind of unpacked the reality that nice. meat consumption is not related to those conditions at all. In the case of type 2 diabetes, uh, we could actually argue exactly the opposite because when people eat adequate protein, they tend to not overeat other right. items. Right. So we, we tackled that, that health piece, and then we got in and started looking at the environmental considerations. And the case that we made is that you can't have any other system but a regenerative row crop food system that, you know, if we come back a thousand years from now, what is our food system going to look like? And some people it's going to, they'll say it's growing food in a vat or it's hydroponics. And we, we kind of went into all the physics and thermodynamics of mm. that and just made cool. the case that the, the most efficient system we have is sunlight, grass and grazing animals. And that this imagine that. I mean, nature, like who came up with that crazy idea? <laughs> nature, God, I mean, you know, I mean, right. pick, pick whichever thing you would, but you know, we didn't cook that up and we've <laughs> had the, the hubris to assume over the last 50, 60 years that we've found an improvement on that, but we didn't, you know, we're, we're mm -hmm. taking massive amounts of energy in the form of fossil fuels and using that to intensify our, our uh, food system. And that is destroying our topsoil. It's poisoning our waterways. And once the topsoil is gone, we're right. done. Like the, right. it's it's pretty much game over at that point. That's so, what uh, that's what uh, Eric from Rep Provisions. Yeah, I love yeah. the way he puts us. He's like, we're just this big rock spinning in space with this teeny tiny layer of topsoil that supports yeah. all life. And yeah. like, oh, I forgot the number. Maybe you know. I think he said something like eighty billion tons or some twenty billion. I got I, I, I got to find the number, but it's just blowing into the waterways yeah. because of our practices of the way that we're managing our animals and our crops. Yeah. Do you mind if I do you mind if I take you back to health real quick? Did you please, guys please do you guys do anything with like with the the brain function, cognitive function, like DHA or you know um, gut health, or did you get into any of that on how plants we versus didn't animals go, affects us? We didn't go super deep on that, other than than mentioning that um, long chain omega three fats are you, you can get them from from vegan sources like algae and, but yeah. it's really expensive. It's difficult to do, Right. but we, we, you know, the, the big nutrients of concern in a, a animal inclusive diet, or I, I guess either way, iron, zinc, omega-3 fats, getting adequate protein. And this yeah. is something that Diana is much better on, but um, to get 30 grams of protein from beef is something like 230 calories to get that same amount of protein from beans and rice is almost 800 calories. Right. And sense. it still isn't the same amino acid profile. Right. You don't get the same anabolic signaling. And in, in this age right now where everybody's terrified of mTOR, that, that is itself like a whole challenging thing to, to deal with. But we didn't, we didn't have the space to go super deep on that. So we, okay. we treated yeah. it at a very superficial level. Okay. We, we did mention that the likelihood of developing depression, anxiety, suicide among vegan and vegetarians is sky high. Like it is wow. so much uh, higher 
than it is within meat, uh, you know, animal product inclusive populations. I, I have found that just in working with people. I, yeah. I have found that. And I don't know. I, I don't know if it's gut health, maybe so much fiber or processing. I don't know, but I have seen people come off veganism and go into eating meat and that goes away. Right. Yeah. And I don't know if it's gut healing or if it's just the omegas in the brain, but I, I've witnessed that happen. It's with, probably with all of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. All right. So let's go back into now um, our ethical conversation here. Yeah. So, you know, if, and again, this is assuming that what Diana and I are putting forward and, you know, people, Mm -hmm. people like uh, the folks from Rep Provisions and Joel Salatin and uh, uh, the Savory Institute, but if it's, if the case is true that it's going to be hard bordering on impossible to adequately feed humans, particularly growing humans, you know, like pregnancy, infants, children, um, that first thousand days of life is critical for neurological development. And, and we see that when kids don't get proper nutrition, particularly iron and adequate protein and omega three fats, they never cognitively develop the way that they could have, like they are stunted forever. So if animal products are really important for human nutrition, if there's a case to be made that the industrial row crop food system can't exist indefinitely and that the contrast of that, this regenerative food system that includes grazing animals, grass, and using them interactively within our, our other uh, you know, plant-centric um, processes, this is the way that farms used to work you know, prior to the 1940s, 1950s. They used animals in this, mm-hmm. this process. But there's a case to be made that that is the only food system that we have that could work for a thousand years, 5,000 years, you know, then all of a sudden the ethics start getting really interesting. You know, it's like, can you do anything but this system and, and have an ethical argument, but there's yeah. still this, this piece that um, there's definitely been some horrible practices within the, the modern food system with the way that sure. animals are, are treated. Um, it's interesting. Most people feel like, chickens and pork are a better option than beef, uh, you know, from an ethics mm-hmm. and a sustainability standpoint, but even your, your typical CAFO beef that ends up in, you know, your supermarket shelf, they spend 70% of their lives on grass. It's mm-hmm. only the remaining 30% that they're in a feedlot and they still get to move around and, and they're, they're relatively out in the open. Chickens and pork are basically in body size cages their whole life. Like chickens, have to be called before five weeks because otherwise they will just die. They've been so genetically wow. modified to grow super quickly that, that their organs start failing like they're, they're an absolute disaster. Wow. And the only food that they eat is, is grain and soybean inputs. Like that's all that is fed to, to chickens right. and, and pork. Prior to the industrialization of the food system, chicken was a really rare treat. It was like Sunday dinner that people really look forward to and different grazing animals, lamb, beef, uh, uh, goat, things like that were the mainstay for people day to day. Makes sense. So, Yeah. And so a, a final part of the ethics is, is just that some people are really concerned the way that animals are treated and rightfully so. And then also there's this thought that a vegan or vegetarian diet is um, causing less harm because you're not killing an animal to eat it. But when you get in and really look at the reality behind that, the row crop food system kills enormous amounts of animals, insects, invertebrates, snakes, True. and it just expunges whole ecosystems. It, it, you know, to plant a farm, you have to remove all of the other life that's there to do it. Unless True. you do it in one of these more regenerative uh, uh, practices, Um, It's so interesting. Some of these folks uh, are even finding that they will feed some of the the leftover like offal and things that can't be used for anything else to the local coyote population. And then the coyotes don't kill animals in their herd. And and so there's this whole synergy there between, (laughs) um, you know, the animals. But there's been an analysis done on this looking at the total number of animals and insects and, and just all kinds of critters killed in an industrial row crop Mm. setting versus a regenerative setting in a food system that is centered on grass and grazing animals tends to kill far fewer animals in this industrial system. 
Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. That's such yeah. good information. Wow. Yeah. Cause it's, it's it, sometimes I feel like we're thinking of the, the macros and we forget all these little micros of all these other animals right. and it doesn't make any sense. That's really compelling information. Cause it's like, well, is that cow's life worth more than the snakes and the squirrels and the chipmunks right. and all that? Mm, right. That's a great ethical argument. And um, you know, it's, it's been interesting. The Audubon society has historically been very antagonistic towards uh, ranching, but the last couple of years, they've been just wholesale endorsing these regenerative uh, farms wow. because the native bird populations are returning because these ranchers look at their land and if they do things properly, if they create ecosystem opportunities for birds, that benefits the cows. They get more grass, they get more insects, mm, wow. there's more life. And so it's, it's interesting that uh, this outfit that has historically been very antagonistic towards grazing animals, because poorly used grazing animals can and do damage the, 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 the environment. You can yeah. overgraze an area and that, that can be bad, but it's properly managing them. And the interesting thing again is it, it, it's emulating nature. These large right. herds of animals historically had some sort of predator-prey interaction. There were mm -hmm. lions or wolves or something that was constantly nipping at their periphery. And so they would bunch up and they would move together across a grassland. Mm -hmm. And when we removed all of the predators, then the animals kind of go here, kind of go there. And that's the way that overgrazing can occur. But by using portable electric fencing and moving the animals frequently, you can emulate this process and the animals will be let loose on a, a bit of pasture. Like it may be like, you know, eyebrow high pasture and they just like smash their way through it. Pee, poo, stomp on the ground, you know, move through. But then when you move them, the, the land is, uh, uh, I don't want to say hurt, but it, it's similar to exercise. There is right. a stress <laughs> induced on the land. Right. But, then you allow the land to heal. And when it heals and regenerates, it becomes better. The nutrients from the pee and the poo and all the, the dung beetles moving through and everything makes the land better. So Absolutely. this is where we start getting these kind of uh, multiple beneficial characteristics out of the regenerative practice. Whereas the extractive process of using um, fossil fuels to produce synthetic chemical fertilizers and, and herbicides and pesticides. The only thing you get out of it is that run of food, but then the land is degraded, the, the ecosystems are damaged, and you've got a, a limited time run on that. Like, again, we've mentioned a couple of times, once that topsoil is gone, then that system is done. Right. Yeah. So like for people, if, if this is new to you, I mean, basically what happens is, um, as, as Eric was explaining is that the, the cows have their favorite grass, right? And especially mm -hmm. when it's fresh and newly grown, it's this nice little sweet, tender patch of grass and they just eat it and eat it, eat it till it's gone. And then we have this yep. patch of topsoil that blows into the oceans and the waterways. And that's what, that's what's happening all over the place. Not to mention, like you said, all the chemicals that are being used. And it's so, don't you just like, don't you just marvel at us as human beings, like the nerve that we have to interfere at the level that we do. We think we're like so smart. And I'm like, we don't even know how our bodies work. Like if you right. think you know how the body works, make one. Oh, you can't? Oh, okay. Then you don't know how it works. Right. And so it's just like, man, as you dig into this, it's like the nerve, the, the, the pompous attitude that we have to think that we are so smart that this won't have a, a, a negative impact down the road is crazy. And like what you're pushing here is just a return to nature. That's all, that yep. is all you're put, promoting here is like, Hey, let's honor and respect this earth that we just popped up on and found ourselves on. And, and re, how do we return back to that in our modern lifestyles is basically what I'm hearing from you here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, and it's an interesting interplay of really um, looking at nature for, for what it is and trying to emulate it. Yeah. But then there's all these interesting opportunities to use technology. Like people yeah. are just starting to use drones yeah. to overfly their, their property. And it uses infrared imaging to tell yeah. when the grass is really ready to be grazed. And it's, it's interesting. People oftentimes yeah. have questions around scaling this. Like, can you, can you feed the whole world with a, a regenerative practice? And there's a couple of different pieces to that. One of them is in the United States in particular, we have huge tracts of land that are offline for animal grazing. The government actually pays people to not graze animals on it, which is mm. kind of mind boggling. Mm. But 
there's a lot of land there that we could get animals onto. And, and again, this is if you buy into the notion that properly applied grazing animals regenerate the topsoil, grow new topsoil, improve carbon sequestration, like it actually pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and puts it underground mm -hmm. and improves water mm -hmm. retention, then mm -hmm. there's a huge benefit there. Yeah. Another piece to this story is, um, it, and Diana did a beautiful job of capturing this in the film, actually. She went down to the Chihuahua Desert and interviewed a rancher there who has recovered a million acres of the Chihuahua Desert and reverted it to grassland. Like wow. when she drove there, they drove for like six hours, desert, desert, desert. Like imagine like Las Vegas, just yeah. like cactus and sage. Right. And then they started seeing grass and then it was like chest high grass as Ooh. far as they could see. And what this guy did is it, where the Chihuahua desert was, was virtually destroyed is they started putting up fencing and parceling the stuff off and just letting the animals graze as they wished and they would overgraze. This right. is a brittle environment. They only get 10, 10 inches of rainfall a year. Wow. And, and so when the grassland started disappearing, then just massive erosion occurred. The wow. locals that live there, some of them like six, seven, eight generations, didn't even know that grass could grow there. Right. Because it's just, yeah. And, and so there's enormous amounts of land, like the whole Great Basin going from Reno to Utah down to Las Vegas, Mm -hmm. That used to be grassland, like verdant grassland. So there's all this stuff that has been desertified that is washing wow. into our waterways, you know, um, removing topsoil that's very difficult to build and it's yeah. damaging the waterways. We can reverse all of that with properly applied grazing animals. Then a final piece Huge. to this is when we look at current production capacity, when when we look at the efficiencies of a grass centric model, it depends on where you are. Like someone like Joel Salatin, he's able to get about four to five times more productivity out of his land than other people. Like he will, when he talks to ranchers, he'll say, would you like four times more land? And they're like, yeah, sign me up. And he's like, I can't do that, but I can teach you how to run four times more animals on your land. Amazing. So, so in, he's in Virginia though, and it's pretty moist there. So you can grow yeah. a lot of grass. Um, more brittle areas, the, the estimate is more like 30 to 50% increase, but we've got somewhere between a 50% to 500% increase in the number of animals that we could produce on the planet. And, and something that's important to remind people, if we were to, to divide up um, all of the land of the earth into a, a credit card, mm -hmm. two thirds of that land are amenable for nothing but grasslands. Like that's what they are. You can't crop wow. on them. Not, not with any real, you know, significant consistency. Like it literally is only meant to grow grass and the animals that live on that grass. Wow. So when you start wow. putting all of that together, right. it's a, it, it, it's a pretty compelling case, but it really flies in the face of everything we hear from right. the health side, from the, from the environmental side, and definitely from the ethical side. Wow. Yeah. That's that, this is, this is the information that that's needed, right? Because we we're all we're also out of touch. We're not farmers. Like we don't know, you know, and we all have these like really strong opinions and we really don't even understand how the world works. We don't even understand what we have available to us, what resources there are. And we're like, yeah, yeah. I'm sure like somebody can just like grow plants for everybody somewhere. Like right. <laughs> really that's kind right. of where we're coming from. And we don't even, we're not even looking at it. I love that credit card analogy. Cause it's like, Hey, here's what we got. You want to feed the whole entire world population? off of this one third with just plants and no, but by the way kill a bunch of animals in the process right hmm. and destroy our topsoil and, destroy and be nutrient deficient yeah yeah wow yeah that's what i always tell people i'm like so i don't know how else to introduce regenerative agriculture to you except saving the planet truly yeah it, yep. it truly is like, and that's, you know, we want to get into like fossil fuels and all this stuff. And it's like, hold on, whoa, whoa, whoa back up. Like, what are we using? What's happening the most food, right? <laughs> Food's happening the most, you know? And so to take a look at that and back up and look at it overall picture, thank you for, for doing all that work and putting, putting that into it. Um, I want to sure. talk to you about the film, if you don't mind, can you tell yeah, us a little bit yeah. about the film and what we might find there? Yeah. The, the film supports the book. It, it's, um, 
And it's, it's going to be called Sacred Cow. Sacred Cow also. Uh, it's phenomenal. But it, and, uh, Nick Offerman narrates it. He's uh, Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. Oh, no yeah, way. Yeah. So, so that's yes. super cool. <laughs> super um, cool. And, you know, it... it carries much of the same story arc that we cover in the book, but in the book, the, this is kind of like, uh, you know, the way the China study was kind of like the, the you know, signpost book for the vegan movement. Um, we're hoping that this will kind of be similar for like the regenerative ag sustainable cool. food system. And so it gets super deep. It's kind of, you know, borderline scientific paper through the whole thing. It's very readable, but there's a lot of information there. Mm. The, the movie tells a story, you know, and it, it ties in the ethical, environmental and, and health considerations. Uh, but it but it does it in a, a very accessible way. So somebody who is maybe interested in this stuff, but they're not going to sit down and like plow through a, a fairly dense book. Yeah, then that that's a really good option. And we actually put together a course around both the book and the Ooh, film nice. called meet curious. And uh, we're going <laughs> to actually have affiliates for it. But Love especially it. there are all these people that have been vegetarian or vegan, are thinking about it. They're kind of on the fence, but they're not really sure where to go. And so right. that thing really right. helps unpack all this information and moves people through in kind of like a, a college course format so that they can better understand oh, what all this me. stuff means. And even to the tune of like, how do I cook meat? Like I've got this piece of meat right. in a in a, you know you know, rapper, what, what do I do with it? How do I cook right. it? I, I haven't even handled it in 10 years or something. Right. So yeah. That's a big question. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And I know, I think I bought your keto course and even that I Very was similar. Blown, yep. blown away. I was like, Oh, this is so much information. So that's going to be really wonderful. I'll definitely make sure to, to push that out to my audience. Cool. Cause I want, there's so many people that like, you know, uh, vegans are like, well, I just, I mean, I was just trying to make a good move. I, I was just told like, this is a good move for my health and the planet. Like, I don't know. I was just trying to be like, <laughs> do the best I knew do how. The right thing, so, yeah. Yeah. so it's, it's nice because there's nobody really like presenting this information. You know, there's no like quality meat pushers, <laughs> not really. And, you know, so thank you for, for putting that out there. So people can have oh, a resource you. and they just get educated. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot to unpack. It's a really, it's a lot of information. I mean, we've, we've done kind of like a mini PhD dissertation in like soil health, ecology, you know, and I don't know, you may be down to like four listeners at this point where people are, uh, <laughs> I know. I'm done, you know? Um, and there's kind of a reality. It's sometimes a little heartbreaking. Like I, I'm not in spectacular shape and I'm in a decent shape. And if I do a, a shirtless workout video, then I get 15,000 likes on it. And I do a regenerative ag piece where I talk about, soil sequestration of carbon and water capture, I get like three likes. And, and so it, it's, um, yeah. it's a little kick to the Jimmy in a, in a way in that yeah. regard. But it, it's interesting though. Um, these topics are getting more popular. Like people yeah. are, are starting, you know, COVID has been fascinating in that people have recognized that our health really matters. Yeah. And then we got exposed to, these major uh, fault lines in our food system, you know, like where a very few um, meat processors basically handle all of the meat production within the United States. Yep. Before the 1950s, there were like 200,000 small scale meat processors around wow. the United States. And most of the food got consumed locally. Like you right. raised it locally and you consumed it locally. Now we grow it everywhere, bring it to these central places to process it, then redistribute it, which right. takes fossil fuels totally. and energy and waste and everything. But it's also incredibly uh, non-resilient. You know, like Nassim Talib and some of these people that talk about, uh, uh, you know, resilient systems and anti-fragile. Mm -hmm. Our food system is remarkably fragile. There was actually a 2015 report that talked about a, a very modest uh, domestic terrorist attack could collapse our food system because of the consolidation. Wow. And it was recommended that it should be distributed. And I mean, flying airplanes into a building is one thing, but if you were to cause millions of people to starve to death due to food shortages, man, that would have impact, you know? And uh, we didn't have anybody really interested in that warning then. We have people interested in that warning now. So yeah. uh, Senator Tom Massey right. out of Kentucky had, had 
put a bill forward eight years ago, but nobody's had interest in it called the Prime Act, which would basically allow people to open up these small scale uh, slaughter and butcher, butcher operations, and they still have governmental oversight, but the oversight happens at the local level, whereas the current facilities, you have to have an FDA approved interaction and it's super mm-hmm. expensive. The, um, mm-hmm. the big players have a monopoly on it. Like they will pay the, even when they're not having meat processed, they will pay so that nobody else can bring their animals in to be processed. And so then it forces the small time operator to send their meat 2000 miles away to be processed or something like that. Wow. So it's uh, it's interesting. And the prime act would be a major step towards improving kind of the, the resiliency of our food system. And it would put the power of local production and, and, and processing back in the hands of, of many, many people. Oh, amazing. Thank you for filling us in on yeah. that. I know um, Eric from Rep Provisions was saying that COVID was a really amazing thing that happened in their industry because what happened when, you know, one of these, they, they were having, people were having issues getting their meat processed, right? Yeah. And so here he is, he's like, oh, I just, I sell direct to consumer. And the other ranchers are right. like, wait, what? <laughs> wait, what are you doing? <laughs> he's like, yeah, we just take care of it ourselves. And so that's why I'm always telling everyone I know, I'm like, just please, like, that's your biggest vote. Your dollar is your biggest vote. The way you spend your money, that it says, hey, we like more of this. So I'm, I'm really kind of brutal sometimes with my clients. I'm like, every time, I'm not saying you're going to be able to be perfect. I know you can't be perfect. But every time that you spend money on conventionally raised meat and these big, huge conglomerates, you're saying, yes, more of that. I want more of that. And every time you choose to spend two or three times as much money on this amazing high quality meat that has higher omega-3s, you know, higher CLA. It's it's supporting the growth of the planet, the future of the planet. You're saying, yes, I want more of that, you know? And so like, I, I think there is a shift that's going to have to happen. I know Mm -hmm. for me, when the first time I'm in the grocery store and I'm like, wait, this is $11.99 a pound and this is $3.99 a pound. Oh man. I mean, this is a little bit of a tough moment here for me, but. And you know, to that, to that point, and, and this is something that gets us in trouble with the regenerative ag folks is that, um, a family of four living at the margin and they want to do the best they can for their kids so that they succeed and they have a better life, you know, kind of classic American dream stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, We're telling them that the only option that they have is like pastured grass fed meat or nothing. Right. And, and I think that that's doing folks a a disservice. Like they're, the difference in achievement and physical capacity and and cognition that can be, you know, found from an animal inclusive diet is so powerful. I do think the, the, those of us that have the means to subsidize this transition into the regenerative practice, by all means, we need to take that hit, you know, we need to support that. But at the same time, we can't demonize uh, conventional, um, meat right. production to such a degree that people feel bad True. for just doing the best job that they can because there's so many people living at the margins, you know, low income yeah. and they want to do better, want to do the best they can True. for their family. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting, even on the health side, and this is something that gets us in an enormous amount of trouble. Um, when we set out to write the book, we did this huge outline, like it was 32 pages of outline alone, you know, mm. these different points. Yeah. And and one of the points that we made was um, pastured meat is more nutritious than conventional meat. Mm-hmm. And then we got in and we're like, we need to try to tear down all of these assumptions mm-hmm. because we, we need to tackle it from if we can disprove this, then we're wrong and we need to modify what our position is. And mm-hmm. what we found is the difference nutritionally between grass fed and, gr- and conventional meat yeah. is tiny. Really? It's tiny. Um huh. It, it's all over the place. And I mean, we tortured the data. We, we, yeah. we did everything we could to try to make, because it doesn't play to our, our story the way right, it, right, it's nice. Right. You know, like when yeah. you look at a vegan documentary, it's like everything falls yeah. into line, like everything. Right. And it just didn't. The reality is meat is nutritious. And mm-hmm. even on that omega-3 uh, perspective, yeah. grass-fed meat has a little bit more omega-3 than, huh. than uh, conventionally raised meat. But a three ounce piece of salmon has as much omega three as eight pounds of grass fed meat. 
Wow. So if we're having a pissing match over omega threes, yeah. you can't even bring beef up at all. Like it, it, yeah, you know, it doesn't cool. doesn't exist there. Awesome. Now there are there are ethical reasons to to support pastured meat. There are yeah. environmental reasons to support pastured meat. Yeah. But the nutrition piece isn't really strong. Now, there may wow. be some cases to be made for uh, bioaccumulation, like um, mold can infect grains that are fed to animals, and that aflatoxin can be very, very toxic to both humans yeah. and the animals. Um, there can be some bioaccumulation of things like glyphosate and yeah. atrazine. But that's kind of a separate issue versus just nutrition huh. itself. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. Okay. And, and one other thought, even in that story, there are a lot of regenerative small, small time uh, farms and, and ranches. They raise their animals regeneratively, but economically it makes the most sense for those people to then sell their animals into a CAFO si system for mm -hmm. finishing because they don't have easy access to butchering and processing and all that. Right. And so, so uh, I don't know what the percentage is of mm -hmm. this, but we know that it's significant there are people using regenerative practices. They're keeping their animals on grass, but then they sell them into a CAFO system, but they're still regenerating the soil. They're still sequestering wow. carbon. Like they're still doing lots right. of good stuff. So, right. so even then, wow. it, and part of what I take from this is just that the conventional system actually wouldn't need a big shove to be converted over to a fully regenerative system. True. Like that's really the, the, the interesting thing to take away from all that. Yeah. True. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's, totally. that's really good information because right. We're all going off of like these little bits of information of somebody tested this meat here and there. There's not like, like it's, it's hard to make it all make sense. So that's it. That's a, I love that actually though, because of course you want to be like, yeah, and it's so much healthier too. Cause it, it's convincing, but actually it's kind of more compelling. What you're saying there is like, just eat meat. Like it's so good for us to eat meat. And yep. then we can start working on all these back end things to make it better for our, our, um, planet yep. and, and as a whole. So yep. really absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Before last thing I, before we wrap this up, you mentioned wired to eat. I talk about this book all the time. So this is your, wait, is it how many second books book. you have? Second That's your book. second yeah. book. Okay. Yeah. So wired to eat was so good. Do you mind just sharing like the premise of wired to eat as we wrap this up, even though I know we're talking sacred cow and I hope everyone gets sacred cow. And, oh, by the way, what's the name of the course? With sacred it, it, cow? That one is called uh, meat curious. Yeah. yeah. Meat curious. And, okay. and if folks go to uh, sacredcow.info, then they can find everything about this. the book, the film, meat curious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sacredcow.info. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. And then, yeah. Do you mind wrapping up with the premise of Wired to Eat? Cause it's just so good. Yeah. You know, like uh, my first book was the Paleo Solution and I, I, I still yeah. like that book. Like I feel like it was a solid book and yes. I, I probably should have written other books, but I really, I was at a loss for what I would do differently. You know, I'm a big uh -huh. fan of this kind of paleo esque, lowish carb, keto. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm like, uh, oh, <laughs> if you need more carbs, ratchet the carbs up. Like, right. no big deal. Yep. You can handle rice. Good. Yep. Easy. Like, we can figure that out. <laughs> so, I was really at, at a bit of a loss as to what I would do next. But I, I'm always getting research and reading it and thinking about it and taking notes. And there were really two big things that popped up. There was this one paper, uh, Determinants of Brain Evolution and the Omnivore's Real Dilemma. And it basically got in and talked about the neuroregulation of appetite and how we are wired to eat as much as possible while doing as little as possible. And that struck me and I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's not your fault. Like the fact that you want to overeat, the fact that you go into a 7-Eleven and grab everything there and eat it all is amazing. Like there's no Pharaoh of Egypt, King of England that ever had as many food options as a low income individual walking into a 7-Eleven. And when you understand our neuroregulation of appetite, that, that biology has incentivized us to eat as much and as many things as we possibly can, then you're like, well, of course we overeat. Like the fact that you and I are not overweight and sick means that evolutionarily we're like losers. Like we, we're failing. We should be <laughs> eating everything that's not nailed down. So that was really powerful. I was like, man, yeah. that is just such a perception change. And totally. it's cool. I've had a lot of people that um, had suffered from lifetime disordered eating and a lot of guilt mm -hmm. around 
the process. And when they read that, that section in particular, they were like, I get it. And I don't right. need to blame myself. Like right. you have to figure out strategies. It's kind of like a right. self-defense strategy. Like you can understand that biker bars are not safe, but if you keep going to biker bars and getting your ass kicked, then it's like, dude, you gotta, you, you need a better yeah. strategy than that. Right. You know? right. So, so that part was really powerful, but I didn't okay. feel like it was a, a book. You know, it's, it's like, that's interesting, but I didn't feel like it was a book. And then there was some research that came out of the Weizmann Institute in Israel, looking at the reality that um, people respond shockingly differently to the carbohydrates that they consume. And so they, they did a full gut microbiome analysis, a genetic analysis, lipidology uh, questionnaires, and then they started feeding people these meals while these folks wore a continuous glucose monitor. And what they found was just like jaw dropping, like it, it, they had a, it really fascinating examples of like a cookie and a banana. And one person would, they would eat a cookie and their blood glucose was just flat. It did nothing. It was like they drank water. And then that same person would eat a banana and it would be nearly diabetic ranges and then vice versa. And what they okay. found is that so long as people ate in a way that they didn't get these huge blood sugar excursions. They tended to be healthier. They tended to not overeat. And it was kind of the, the two ends of this thing, like the, the um, perspective that we're wired to eat everything that we can and get as much variety as we can. And we need a strategy for dealing with that. Mm -hmm. And then this, this back end part that kind of answers all the dietary wars. Some people do well on high carbs and people do well on low carb, you know, and some people do well on some carbs, but not all carbs. And so that, and still in the middle of that is this kind of paleocentric, keto oriented, you know, approach, but we could inform it on the front end with this understanding that it's not our fault that navigating this modern food environment is hard. Like it is. Right. And we can, we can forgive ourselves, but then at the same time, we need to do something like now that we're enlightened on it, it's like, you can't just keep doing the same, same stuff, you know? Yeah. It, and then on the back end, we had this, this technology where we, we would do the seven day carb test, where we would encourage people mm -hmm. to pick a, a battery of carbs, test their blood glucose, and then people could really customize and find what worked for them. And for a lot of people, what they discovered, they were like, holy smokes, I have like diabetic blood glucose levels. Like I either need to eat a different type of carb or less of this carb or I need to eat it post-workout, or I need some vinegar or some protein. With it. You know, there's all these mitigating right. strategies that you could do. But when people would see where their blood sugar went and then notice the after effects, I get hungry, I get fatigued, I get lethargic, right. I have joint inflammation, then it was crystal clear. Like they had both right. a, a subjective and objective validation that like, oh, okay, yeah. white rice is not a good option for me. Yeah. yeah. I love this so much. I always say like, well, just going in a guilt and shame, it doesn't help anything. Right. It's just like, mm -hmm. I don't know what's wrong with me. It's like, there's nothing wrong with you. This is just not yeah. working. So let's find we a just solution. just haven't found does. the right strategy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I love this with the, the continuous glucose monitors are so cool. Cause I have clients yeah. with them too. And it's like, they'll eat strawberries and go freaking bananas on their blood sugar, oh, but they'll eat a banana and they won't have that much of a rise. So it's just so personal. And, it's and, and you know, some out. of that is, um, I think immunogenic. So when people have an immune response to a particular food, so this mm. is a, an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Mm. If you, even though the food may not be high in carbohydrate, if it causes a stress response, then the, the catecholamines, the Good adrenaline point. will be released. And then you, so that glucose wow. could be coming from your liver, but it still is a, a negative response. Like it's a yeah. sign that we have difficulties or problems there. Yeah. yeah, super, yeah. That's super interesting thought too. Yeah. Wow. So cool. Rob, thank you so much for coming on thank and you. talking about this. Thank you for everything you're doing in the industry. Like guys, Rob is just like, you just, you're a world changer, you're a world changer. So thank, thank you. you so much for caring enough and then putting in the work and action to get it done. We, we all kind of depend on you a little bit, you know, you're like, <laughs> Rob's the guy coming out from the thank paleo you. world to, to, to represent. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. And thank you for coming on today. To share honored. Thank you.